Test. All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is the last panel discussion here for uh, West 2023. Uh, do the sea services have the resources they need to meet the challenges of today and tomorrow? We'll be kicking off in about five minutes when Admiral Greenert uh, comes. Uh, if you could come and find a seat, sit down front, prepare your questions. Um, or just a reminder to turn off your or silence your devices. And uh, once the event is done and we've done all the Q&A, please use the, uh, the, the feedback function in the West app to provide feedback on the, uh, on the discussion this morning. All right, should we make everyone come forward? This is <laughs> Sir, would you apply? So, so everything I say, you'll back me up and go, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, me too. Uh, we're not live going out of the mics are on right now. Hey, sir, I, I hope you still to ask you hard questions okay. about installation <laughs> funds. <laughs> That's 24 Street of Sinker. <laughs> Indeed. I'm doing well, sir. Of our conference. Hey, Mark. Yeah. Yeah. Great show. Always the highlight of the loop. Oh, yeah, of course. All right. I would not. It is a bit stealthy to get there. No, it's just my wife and I. How about you guys? I did it backwards. I got older and I got married. I got kids. I got, I got two. I got 14. All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Bill Hamlet from the Naval Institute. Uh, welcome to the panel session. Do the sea services have the resources they need to meet the challenges of today and tomorrow? I think the Reader's Digest version is no, but our panel today is probably going to give you a much more in-depth uh, answer to that question. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing the moderator for the panel, Admiral John Greenert, U.S. Navy, retired, former Chief of Naval Operations. Admiral Greenert is a native of Butler, Pennsylvania. He graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy in 1975, became a nuclear submariner. As a submariner, his assignments included USS Flying Fish, USS Tautog, Submarine NR-1, USS Michigan, and he commanded the USS Honolulu, from March 1991 to July 1993. Uh, he later commanded U.S. 7th Fleet, U.S. Fleet Forces Command, served as the Vice Chief of Naval Operations, and became the 30th Chief of Naval Operations in September 2011. 
Ladies and gentlemen, Admiral John Greenert. Good morning. Uh, so we're going to do things a little bit different from the other panels uh, from this regard. Uh, I'm going to introduce the folks, set the stage a little bit, ask a few general questions, and then I would like to introduce anybody that wants to ask a question, go ahead and go to the mic. I will feed them questions, you know, and as a retired flag officer, we could talk all day up here and make stuff up about what we want to talk about. But uh, we'll shift to the audience as soon as feasible, and we'll go to those audience questions, and then I'll fill those in when there's not an audience person up there that would like to uh, ask a question. So uh, we've got a, a really interesting group here. We go from Gumbleton here, uh, the Comptroller of the Navy, who, by the way, what I don't understand is why he has no gray hair and has hair. I don't get it, because if you serve in this long enough, you kind of look like this, or Terry Blake back there, which is a disaster. So if there's anything you want to do uh, or understand about resources, you have to kind of, it can wear you out, except there's something that he does. With uh, General Chris Mahoney, and then, of course, uh, Vice Admiral Kevin Lundy. Uh, Lunday, excuse me. So first of all, uh, introducing the panel, uh, Vice Admiral uh, Lunday is uh, commander of the Atlantic area. And you say, well, what, what's that got to do with you know, the budget? I thought we were going to talk about resources. And we are, but in typical fashion, the Coast Guard says, you guys sweat it out too much over at the Department of the Navy. Anybody can do this stuff. Uh, somebody that operates a, com you know, a whole area, the largest area within the Coast Guard, we can handle this, these resource questions as well. And so, Kevin, I really uh, am happy that you've been willing to do that. His background is phenomenal. He's got a great operating background. Clearly, he's an area commander. But he also commanded the 14th District, which think of that is for us in the Navy, the 7th Fleet. He had that whole area. And uh, you lived at the Lighthouse, didn't you, in I Hawaii? Did, yes, sir. Yeah, he lived at the Lighthouse at uh, Diamond Head, if you know where that is, in Hawaii. But also on top of that, he was the director, or excuse me, the uh, yeah, assistant commandant for readiness, so that's material, that's contracting, that's logistics. It's a broad spectrum of things. <clears throat> on top of that, he served twice in the cyber arena, once at Cyber Command, and he ran cyber for the Coast Guard. Uh, he has a degree in marine engineering. He has a law degree. So he has a law degree, and he was a JAG, effectively, for the Coast Guard. In fact, there's probably a new TV special coming out just on his life about being a lawyer and, in addition to that, commanding the largest area. And he also graduated with a master's from National Defense University. Uh, General Mahoney is the Deputy Commandant for Resources and Programs for the Marine Corps, think Chief Financial Officer of the Marine Corps. And so he was doing great in life, flying an A6E, flow F-14s, the F-35, commanded at uh, Mar 4 Pack as the Deputy, commanded at U.S. Forces Japan, Deputy in, in Japan. Uh, he also has a master's uh, from Canberra University. That's not a bad gig, right? That's why he's so easy going. And also for Air University. So life was good. He was out operating Marine Forces, and they said, no, get back here. You need to run, be the chief financial officer for the Commandant. And then we have our comp, the Department of the Navy Comptroller, uh, John Gumbleton, a.k.a. Gumby, who is uh, served very well, very well prepared for this job in that he was FMBE, think legislative representative for the Department of the Navy, the Hill Appropriations, because you can put all kind of NDAAs out there, but if somebody doesn't put money in there to write a check, like the Secretary mentioned uh, in his remarks, it isn't going to happen. So he did that liaison for the Navy, ran operations, Department of Operations, or Director for Operations uh, in the Department of the Navy, FMB, uh, which is O&M account and the manpower account. Uh, he is a graduate of Norwich uh, University, George Washington University, where he has a master's, and the Naval War College, where he has a master's. So just to kind of pick up what, uh, what Bill said in the introduction, the question is, do the services have enough resources to counter threats today and in the future? Well, the editorial on that and the Reader's Digest is today, of course they do, because we are deterring threats. But the real question is, are we aligned in the future to have enough resources? And the folks today are going to talk not directly about that, but with the money that we have, where are we putting the priorities 
and uh, what are your priorities in the future and how are things going? But it's a hard question to answer threats in the future because if you say, well, how do you define having enough resources for threats? If the definition is, do you have enough money for all the requirements, the answer to that is no, of course not. Or why would we have an unfunded requirements list every year or an unfunded priority list? So no. And the question may be, well, how do you meet threats in the future? And you say, by putting together a strategy. So your Department of the Navy respective service strategy should do that. And to the extent they align with the national security strategy, the national defense strategy, and that is all funded, the answer would clearly be yes. But those strategies and the budget run two separate courses. So it would be sort of a coincidence if in fact we had adequate and, and are completely aligned funding to our strategy in the future. The combatant commander's request, which some say is an unending appetite, are aligned to the strategy, the national defense strategy. Uh, they are given their part of that and they say, well, this is what I need to do it. But that is not necessarily how the Office of Management Budget tells the Department of Defense, this is your top line and you do the best you can. The service chiefs do what they do with the service secretaries, the those under the Title 10, to bring those two together in the Pentagon and it's a, a, a very nicely synchronized measure to uh, put together the, the president's budget. So if you think strategy, maybe another simple way of helping to think this through is the strategy, all strategies have an ends. They have ends, ways, and means. The ends are the objectives. This is what we want to get done. This is what they give to the combatant commanders. The ways that they do it is what the combatant commanders are assigned to do. And you build the problems the, the programs to do that, you ask for the forces to do that, and then lastly, do we have the means to do that, and that becomes the big question. And uh, unfortunately, our processes and the world around us make it extremely difficult to balance ends, ways, and means. And that becomes the conundrum that the folks on my left uh, help, help deal with, with what are the priorities that we absolutely have to get funded, how do we do that, how do our services prepare a budget which is good enough such that when we bring it forward and we try to articulate it to the, our respective services, Department of Homeland Security or Department of Defense, and then most importantly, take it out of the executive branch to the legislative branch and have them fund it at the levels that we need it and on the timing that we need it so that we can deliver it. So having said all that, let's start out with what are the priorities, if you will, uh, within your services? And uh, Gumby, I'll start with you. And the question is, uh, please summarize with us uh, the, the 2023, you have an approved budget. Uh, describe a bit uh, how you did there, how were your priorities funded, of course, what are they? And as you look ahead, I understand you can't talk about the President's budget yet, but help us get an appreciation for those, those priorities for 2024. Thank you. Hey, you bet, sir. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm super excited to be here and uh, have a good chat with y'all. Um, I was walking around AFCIA, C4ISR, a cyber environment, and you know everyone's about this uh, zero trust environment. I'm like, I've been working in zero trust environments now for several years, so I don't see what the big deal is. But uh, <laughs> that's just a joke. All right. Um, actually. Uh, the Navy in 23, and I think what you're going to see in 24 is, is doing quite well. Uh, do we have everything we need? No. With respect to priorities, so uh, if you happen to see the Secretary's keynote this morning, uh, he, he, he listed them for you. You know, of course, it's all about the uh, Columbia first, and that's, that's a given. Uh, take no chance, take no expense. But then it's a balance and priority of readiness to fight tonight. Uh, capabilities or modernization development, and then uh, capacity. So in 23, uh, put in a pretty hefty budget, and then Congress uh, threw some more at it, right? Uh, another 10 billion. Uh, so there's what I'm hoping is clear signals to our industry friends on what we need to buy in the capacity arena. I think uh, that strategy and those priorities will not change in 24. So there'll be no daylight 
And I think what you will also find is 24 is very consistent with what we requested in 23 in terms of uh, capacity. Uh, Columbia, of course, still going strong. And then uh, I think what we'll also see is, uh, you know, we've all been talking about the, the pacing threat, China, there has to be uh, this relevance of being able to fight tonight. And so uh, you'll also see a lot of moves there. So that's the, the never ending question is, how do you get that balance right? The balance between risk today versus modernization risk uh, 10 years from now, what you put in your program. But at the end of the day, you're gonna see consistency with Columbia readiness, capabilities and capacity. So my understanding is between the president's budget and what the Congress put in, you're pretty happy in 2023. Uh, yes, sir, and, and uh, I'll, I'll save that for another question if we talk about inflation and other things like that. Okay, but yeah. thank you, Chris. And thanks, and thanks to the FCA folks for allowing us to come up and talk. 150 years of goodness from the Naval Institute on that part. You guys had a great party last night. The food was great, but you got to do something about that view, okay, <laughs> for those of you who are there. Um, a little bit about 23 for the Marine Corps. Uh, it gets its uh, roots well uh, in the past. You might have heard yesterday from the ACMAC that uh, it was – General Neller, Commandant Neller, or Commandant Dun uh, Dunford that said, we are not manned, trained, or equipped for the future fight. Holy cow. You know, I I've been a Marine for 34 years, and, and we always pride ourselves on being ready for what the character and the requirements of the next fight we think are going to be. So to say something like that uh, was a real declaration that made change necessary. So as far as it reaches back to that statement, the DNA reaches back to the days of Commandant Krulak, if anybody remembers the Urban Warrior and uh, Hunter Warrior series. Uh, Jaeger Air takes a little bit of DNA there, if, if people remember that, and certainly uh, Commandant Hagee in distributed operations. Uh, but I was in the green room, uh, I always want to say that, I was in the green room uh, in the workup to coming up here on stage, and I picked up a Naval Institute uh, magazine it had a special on U.S. Uh, Marine Corps aviation in the Pacific War in World War II. And it educated me or reminded me that our contribution to the fleet to sea control, to sea denial, is nothing new. In fact, it has some conclusive statements in here about direct support to the Marines on the ground or the soldiers on the ground and the percentage of sorties being much, much lower than a concomitant percentage dedicated to the fleet, somewhere on the order of 12% in direct support to 58 or 60% in support of the fleet. So what we're talking about now as we move forward into 23 truly tr has its roots uh, way back in, in the Navy Marine Corps team, at least as far back as World War II. So not manned or trained or equipped, We've been through five cycles, budget cycles, under Commandant Berger to fix that and get after a true strategy to fix that. And just like Admiral Gumbleton said, I think you will find consistency from 2019 to today. I think you will find a constancy of message and themes strategically in those five cycles. We started with realizing that we had to change, change or lose. And we looked at the things that we didn't need. We looked at the things that we needed less of, and we made divestment and investment decisions based on primarily those two pillars. We wanted to pay our own freight. We wanted to live within our means, all at the same time aligning with what we think uh, the national strategic documents, the library thereof, tells us to do. And out of that came Force Design 2030. You know, a big marquee now appearing, Force Design 2030, what it ought to say is now appear in close alignment and integration with what the nation needs to face a pacing threat in a certain geographical area, but not exclusively. So the things that we pursue, the things that we will fund, are not, they are focused on, but not exclusively applicable to 100 miles of strait between Taiwan and China or the northern end of Philippines and some other place. 
Long-range precision fires are not divorced from any landward littoral area as far as interdiction and sea control. Uh, exquisite sensing and the ability to see, sense, understand, describe to the fleet uh, is not relegated to a specific geographical area. And I think most of the people, especially the people wearing uniforms in here, go, yeah, you're right. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, if it is a high-end fight in the South China Sea, as was alluded to earlier with the SECNAV, or in the East China Sea, or someplace west of the International Dateline in the Pacific area, it will immediately go global. It's not a question of horizontal escalation. It's a question of the entire globe being intertwined in what that conflict will bring whether it's the transport and communication of people and goods and commodities and trade, it will happen immediately. I don't, I'm not sure of another force that has the mission statement or has the tradition of being able to work globally forward and have an influence uh, almost immediately than the naval force. And, uh, you know, to parrot or to jump on some of the things that the ACMAC said yesterday is move, maneuver, and sustain in the landward littorals, support the fleet in the seaward littorals, and be able to support the joint force with the effectors of the influences that they're trying to have. So in five cycles, get rid of what you don't need. Buy less of what you need less of. Invest in those things that you think and what war games and experimentation and the national strategy tells you that you're going to need for the future character of war, and that's where 23 is leading us. Do we have enough? See the smile? Of course we do. Just kidding. That wasn't a smile. Uh, you could always use more, but, but Admiral Gumbleton is right. If there is a hole in our swing, I want someone like Jerry Glavy, who's in charge of our cyber and info and intel, to come tell me where it is. I saw Angus Walsh around here from our CISCOM. If there is a hole in our swing, come and tell me. There is not a hole in our swing. What we need to do is strengthen the swing. If that means capacity, that's what it means. If that means better work on program wholeness over time, that's what it means. If that means working on affordability over time, nod your head, that's what, that's what it means. So I'll leave, I'll leave the details of 23, sir, uh, to maybe some follow-on questions, but consistency of strategy aligned with what we think uh, the department and the nation is telling us to do and a reasonable level of funding right now Thanks. Kevin, a view from the Coast Guard, please. Uh, thanks, Admiral. Hey, good morning, everyone. It's great to be up here as part of the Navy Coast Guard Marine Corps team. And I think, as you know, as, an art, as a, um, uh, a maritime nation, uh, the United States needs a strong and can, needs to depend on a strong and agile Coast Guard as part of that team. And, of course, you all know the Coast Guard is one of the key members at all times, one of the six armed services, and part of the joint force, fully integrated in operations every day, um, as part of the joint force, but we're the only part of the joint force that sits outside the Department of Defense under the Department of Homeland Security, and our budget system and process is on the non-defense side of the federal budget under Homeland Security, which presents some unique challenges for us. Um, but the Coast Guard today and in the way forward under the Commandant's direction that we prepare for the future, understanding that tomorrow looks different and so will we, the Commandant set forth a bold vision, strategic vision of transformation for the Coast Guard to enable us not only to sustain our operations and meet the nation's demands today, but to be ready for the demands for the future. You know, we think about the national security strategy and uh, Admiral Gumbleton and General Mahoney talked about that library of strat national strategy that, that drives us down. And I think as I read the strategy released in mid-October, the NSS, and, and the line that first caught my attention, I think it did as yours as well, is that this is the decisive decade for the United States and our allies it will determine whether the vision that we have set forth for a free and prosperous world, democratic world, will prevail. Um, it must prevail. Um, that's not in the strategy, but clearly the president intends that to be so. And so that imperative for us, uh, the drumbeat of that decisive decade that we're in, creates a sense of urgency uh, for the Coast Guard and the rest of the Joint Force, for the Department of Homeland Security, um, as we look at investment and how do we balance the sustainment of our operations today with the uh, investments to modernize and prepare for that future over this decisive decade. And not just in terms of the strategic competition that we're engaged in, but of some of the other challenges, challenges of a changing climate.
climate and the impacts of that on human migration, human security, uh, transnational crime and other malign influence, um, and some of the other challenges that we face with the acceleration, proliferation of technology and the access of malign actors to more technology and data than they had before and more power and influence perhaps in new ways than they had before. Um, and so the commandant is laid out underneath the, her direction for the Coast Guard. Our Coast Guard strategy has three lines of effort. First is transform our total workforce, which is about ensuring our ability to attract, recruit, attract, retain, develop, and then be able to support our force and families, not only today but in the future. Understanding that there are complexities in the workforce um, and would-be workforce today that maybe we had challenges we didn't face before. And we're struggling to meet our recruiting goals, particularly in our junior enlisted workforce, in pouring enough effort and investment um, that we need to attract and retain the best. That's not new to the Coast Guard or not different than the other military services. We're in a very competitive environment um, to be able to do that. And the SECNAV talked about that this morning across the tri-services. Uh, the second effort is sharpen our competitive edge. That is, give our force the tools and technology necessary to be able to deliver the advantages to generate readiness, resiliency, and capability in new ways to meet the nation's needs. So we heard Captain Brian Erickson and team members, he's our chief data officer yesterday, talk about the stand-up of the Office of Data and Analytics for the Coast Guard, uh, our ability to leverage data as a strategic asset. Um, we've talked about the proliferation of unmanned systems, uncrewed systems, aerial, surface, and subsurface, not only as an enabler, but as a potential threat or risk for the Coast Guard. Um, and Captain Tom Remmers, who's here in the audience, is leading the development of a Coast Guard strategy along those lines. The third line of effort on the Coast Guard strategy, adv advance our mission excellence. Um, take our capabilities and our capacity that we have today and learn how to employ them in new ways to deliver the decisive mission advantage that our force needs and the nation needs the Coast Guard to deliver. Um, across the spectrum of our missions and operations. All of these things, the three lines of effort in our strategy, require investment. And they require that the Congress and the administration support where the Coast Guard needs to go. Well, the good news is we have that support. We have that support from the bipartisan support from the administration, particularly over the last three years of enacted budgets, 21, 22, and 23. We have great support from the administration not only our service secretary, Secretary Mayorkas, Secretary of Homeland Security, and his team, but support that we've seen from the Office of Management Budget and the National Security Council that has been different at a level of attention and focus than I've never seen in my 35-year career. Uh, the demand for Coast Guard services and the support we have with the administration over successive administrations. And so that's great news for us. And we can talk about some of the numbers and where we're going and what we've seen, but today, the Coast Guard from the FY23 enacted is a $14 billion, including non-discretionary. And we can talk about the mix of uh, PCNI, um, acquisition money, to ONS sustainment, which is a constant uh, challenge for us as we look at investing and sustaining today with our modernization efforts. But as we look at the level of investment, what I can tell you is we are continuing what is now almost a two decades of major investment across programs in surface forces, so that's cutters, boats, aviation forces, our C5I enterprise mission platform, um, and our people, while we still try and sustain some of the aging assets. SECNAV talked about ships that are 37 years old. Uh, we have two medium endurance cutters that are in Brooklyn Naval Shipyard. They're over 50 years old. We're trying to get them uh, back underway, and so we're trying to sustain a fleet that's al almost a century, half a century old. The Coast Guard Cutter Polar Star, the nation's only heavy icebreaker, is doing operations down near the South Pole right now. She turns 50 years old this year. The good news is we've got great support to recapitalize those. The National Security Cutters, our capital ships, the fast response cutters, we're building, we just, um, about, to we just uh, about to commission one in a few months, number 51. Um, and then our, we've got a fleet of 11 National Security Cutters, and we're building our first Polar Security Cutter, first heavy icebreaker in half a century right now. And those will be game-changing capabilities the nation needs as we go forward. So we've gotten great support, but what we need is continued support going forward. We need to see in Coast Guard budgets a two to three, I'm sorry, a three to five percent growth to keep up with the rate of inflation to be able to continue to sustain and then deliver the Coast Guard the nation needs going forward. To Admiral Greener's point, we've had some success 
in our unfunded priorities list. We've had some success in supplementals, like hurricane supplementals. But depending on major disasters to tear apart your shore infrastructure so you can get a supplemental is not a good strategy for shore infrastructure recapitalization. Uh, we need a predictable, stable sources of investment and funding in Coast Guard resources. And so far, we've, we've seen that and great support, and we need that uh, support to continue. Thank you, sir. Look forward to the questions. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you all for, for that summary. Uh, good synopsis. Um, so, like, I have a couple of questions here for all of you, and it sort of gets to the business of being a budget officer and executing the budget. <clears throat> So first, uh, uh, Gumby, if you wouldn't mind taking this, in the 2023 budget, Congress provided each service some plus-ups, various and sundry plus-ups in various programs. Did this, in fact, create some unfunded tails, what we call tails? In other words, you build something, well, you have to sustain it, so that just added to your budget, uh, future budget. So talk a little bit about that. Uh, uh, has it been created, and how do you deal with such things? And are they, is it going all right? Yeah, thank you, sir. Um, so, uh, yes. So, uh, Congress <laughs> is the, you know, they, they give you your money, they give you direction. Uh, sometimes it's counter to a services request, uh, and this uh, develops into what we might call a tail. And they're generally in two general categories. One is, as you heard Secretary of the Navy say, you know, we'd like to decom some older ships that are very expensive to maintain. And so, Congress deals with although they enact multi-year money, it's a single year budget. But we balance to a fit up, right? To a five year program. And so should we not win our day in court and we have to keep older ships, we have to pay that over the fit up. Now Congress is generally good to us and we'll say, okay, keep these ships and here's money for that year to maintain them. That doesn't end the fit up profile. And when I was talking about where we want to do, uh, of course, Columbia first, but readiness, capabilities, capacity, you plan that over a fit up, right? And so, hey, there's, you know, there's a billion dollars you're not going to spend on something else. That's the tail. And it also takes the form of sometimes we get uh, new construction things we don't seek. That also comes with a tail. And so, uh, like, uh, discussing warfare, you know, amateurs talk tactics and professionals talk logistics. Uh, single year budget is not a good metaphor. It's your, you have to balance across a fit up and tails are significant and detract um, with the overall objective. All is not as good as it appears at <laughs> first. Chris, your situation, please. Yeah, sir, uh, thanks. Maybe first just a quick lap around our MDAPs for t 23 to set up uh, the ads, you know, we we will put, you know, in excess of 350 uh, JLTVs on the books. Um, we'll put uh, eight G TPS 80s, Gator radars on the books uh, this year. Uh, 74 ACVs, amphibious combat vehicles on the books, getting toward uh, a full program. 1253Ks, I'll get back to that in a second. Uh, six F-35Cs and 15 F-35Bs. So in those, we were given, we were plussed up, rather, uh, two 53Ks and uh, three F-35s, uh, one B model and two C models, if my numbers are correct. Uh, so that is what was accorded us through the magnanimousness of, of Congress and their decisions. It was good for us in the case of 53K and F-35 because it put us back on a procurement schedule phasing and ramp that made the program uh, healthy and affordable. So in direct answer to your question, sir, there are no tails that are not funded in those two uh, MDAPs that we were plussed up, F-35 and CH-53K. However, uh, growth within those programs, whether it's modernization initiatives, whether it is spares, whether it is going to full rate production, that are unplanned or unbudgeted for will create the tails like uh, Admiral Gumbleton said. So right now, uh, those plus ups helped us get back on a healthier ramp. If we cannot control the costs within those programs and the ramps, then we may be forced to make procurement decisions uh, in the medium to long term. Thank you, Kevin. 
Yes, sir, I think the, for the Coast Guard, we have the, some of the similar challenges that General Mahoney talked about in terms of a tail growing on its own, particularly as we look at the impact of inflation as that's had over the last couple of years. Um, I, I will say that we've also begun to better understand what the level of investment that's required, um, for example, in C5I systems that are embedded in our national security cutters that we did not have a full understanding until we've reached this point in their service life. These are amazingly capable ships. Um, and they don't just conduct Coast Guard missions. We organize, train, equip, and present those as ready forces for combatant commanders through the joint uh, global force management process, right? So we've got um, Admiral Tiongson, Pack Area Commander, mentioned yesterday, away she's working for 7th Fleet. Uh, Cutter Hamilton just got back from 6th Fleet Navier deployment. Cutter Spencer, not a national security cutter, but she's uh, under 6th Fleet Nav AF right now. And so these forces are doing DOD missions, not just Coast Guard missions. But what we're understanding is that the level of refresh required, I think this is something Emma Bartz talked about in his panel yesterday, the level of refresh costs more than we expected when we projected the initial life cycle cost. And so we're having to relook at our investment strategy for how much do we invest in C5I systems and the rate of refresh needed, which is different than the HM&E side. Um, and so we understand that better, but it's not what we thought when we laid that out initially, as amazingly uh, capable as these ships are. Um, so that's a challenge we have. I think the other piece is when we laid out what the life cycle cost was, we look at direct cost. But we, we don't typically start out and say this is the whole cost, including indirect cost, th those costs necessary to support our force and families who crew these ships or these aircraft or these other assets. And Coast Guard cutters are not cutters. Be I mean, they're, they're, we don't take ships and they become cutters because we paint them white and put a stripe on the side and U.S. Coast Guard. They become Coast Guard cutters because we crew them with the best young, and, young men and women this nation has under the best leadership, the best training and preparation. And we crew them. That turns them into a Coast Guard cutter, right? And so the amount of investment in our people, that's to transform our total workforce, is it's not a tail, it's a necessary investment, but it's not necessarily baked in, hasn't traditionally been into what we think of when we look at the life cycle cost of an asset, but it needs to be. And so that's a bit of a different approach we're thinking about as well. and puts our investment in our people up front first, even when we think about the asset or the, um, whether it's a cutter aircraft or C5I system. Thanks. Thank you. Next question is on inflation. Kevin, you spoke to it a bit, so you, you can defer if you want when, I come, when it comes to you. But uh, depending on the operations account and the procurement account, it may be handled differently. That is, the challenge may be different. Uh, and so, uh, Emma Gumpton, we'll start with you. How do you deal with inflation? Does DOD subsidize you eventually uh, or up front? Does OMB uh, get involved and reimburse afterward? How do you deal with it? And please speak procurement versus operations if they're different. Yeah, you bet, sir. Thank you for that. And um, actually, I, I really uh, would begin uh, with a thank you, actually, is uh, in our line of work, we deal with the appropriations committees, you know, quite often, daily basis. And even though we submitted our budget in 23 in March or whatever that date happened to be, uh, it doesn't stop there, and they continue working with us all the way up until enactment. And so if I were to begin on our, on our operations accounts, uh, we had a very uh, transparent and collaborative approach with our committee staffers on understanding the inflation we were seeing in 23, or what we observed in 22 and how that might impact 23. So we worked hand in glove with the committees on the cost of fuel which uh, the Navy is a, a obviously a huge consumer of. Uh, not only uh, fuel, but uh, utilities that we observe in the United States or overseas, the cost of a flying hour, et cetera. So in our operations accounts, uh, by working very closely in, with the trust relationship, uh, we were able to mitigate and manage 23. Uh, where, you know, we're only a little bit the ways through it, but I'm, I'm quite confident uh, that we have what we need because of that relationship, and I'm grateful for it. Uh, with our, our people, of course, though, we requested pay raises in and, and, and accordance with inflation and law, so that was taken care of. That's different from procurement, right? So procurement, if you happen to be a, a very large prime, you can seek EPA clause um, 
money, additional funds. And Congress did enact about a billion one for the uh, department, uh, DOD department to go after uh, in the 23 enactment of which uh, the Department of the Navy is seeking every penny of it. Uh, I don't know if we'll get it, but through uh, what we observe through EPA clauses from our friends who happen to be the primes or some obvious growth that we have observed caused by inflation, uh, we're seeking to use those, that appropriation to great effect. And so that's different. Now you could pivot to uh, what is the uh, impact, whether you're having to be a large, mid, or small time uh, contractor, what is the contract that you are operating under? Are you on a firm fixed price? Is there, uh, you know, these things come into play. And so make no mistake, the Department of the Navy will have to pay that bill. It just might not be in this year's contract, right? Because they're gonna, industry has to be successful. Industry needs to have uh, uh, headlamps in front of them and meet the, the street, the quarterly call, their investors, and then serve the us. And so whether we're paying that bill now or in the next contract, I know it's going to come due. I see. Uh, so being the annual appropriations, where there's an annual appropriation, you can sort of, if uh, my words, bake it in uh, whenever you go to defend the budget and you can request it. You're in a longer term procurement account, it's a whole different problem. Uh, indeed, and it depends on the length of the contract sure. and how it's written sure. and the clauses therein. But uh, uh, you could be locked into a firm fixed price contract for multiple years, and, and that would not be a good place to be, I would imagine, for my friends here who have their booths out in the, in the hall here. I see. Thank you. Chris, would you comment, please? Uh, not a whole lot to add on the, on the procurement side. Maybe just that those ads that we talked about in the previous question now, we're actually a hedge against uh, inflation that was uh, pushing negotiations going one, one way or the other. So once again, a thank you to, to the help from uh, our oversight uh, committees and our appropriators for helping us out in that regard. Uh, on the operations side, Admiral Gumbleton said it, said it best. Again, uh, you know, I, I track inflation in three ways. There's pay, there's non-pay, and imagine uh, pay, fuel, and imagine non-pay, non-fuel. Um, and in all those categories, there was relief coming from either in the department or uh, from, uh, from the appropriators in one way, shape, or form. Uh, and guys like uh, Admiral Gumbleton fighting hard to make sure that our purchasing power is maintained uh, throughout, throughout the budget year. Uh, yeah, I can, I can leave it at that, except to say that, you know, the inflation reaction, as quick as it is, is usually late to need. Uh, for that young Marine out there who rolls out to the gas pump and it's, you know, five bucks a gallon sort of thing. So uh, as much help as we get, we're, we're usually shooting just a little bit behind the, behind the duck. Thank you. Kevin, you spoke a little bit about it. Would you like to expound on the, yes, your situation in the Coast Guard? Yeah, thanks, Admiral. And I think for our, uh, on the, uh, the pay side, it's important that the Coast Guard active duty and reserve personnel, uh, military personnel, are able to maintain parity with our other military services, and so that's an important priority for us, and we've been successful doing that. We have not had the same kind of success uh, with addressing non-pay inflation, uh, either in the fuel accounts or in the other uh, discretionary non-pay spending, and so that takes a real bite out of our ONS uh, funding, um, and we've seen that impact come in terms of uh, less available funds to spend on uh, maintenance and sustainment. And so we're, we're working through that, uh, but it's been a challenge, particularly in this period of higher inflation. Thanks, sir. Can so, I come back on that? Is, sure. uh, so thanks to Congress for what they did in 23, but inflation's been around for a long time, right? It's just been noteworthy here in the last year and a half. But the other side of this coin is that your Department of Defense and your Navy and Marine Corps has been growing at roughly 2% a year, yet inflation in the industrial base far and away exceeded 2% for the last 10 years. And so we weren't keeping up with inflation. We're making do with our operations this year, and that's the message. And now that we're seeing whether inflation, depending on which indice you see it at nine or 6%, but spare parts are double digits. The growth we're seeing in the primes are much higher than that. 
So we're not keeping up, but we're making do in 23. I just wanted to make that clarity. Great. Okay. Okay. Sir, just to, if I can trail on that, because when I have to go to my budget officer and defend uh, program growth or cost growth due to inflation, and the best I can do is say, did you see the Bureau of Labor and Statistics this morning? Uh, that, that doesn't quite cut it. Uh, we need a, a qualitative data drill down to what asset class, what parts bin, what supply chain is causing or is affected by inflation and causing the department to have reduced buying power in that very specific way. It makes it very difficult for me to reflect it, and it makes it even more difficult for uh, Admiral Gumbleton to go and make a case uh, to the department uh, with his Don hat on. Yeah, so if you're building a complex thing, uh, the inflation, the, the sum of all the inflation indices can be quite different from fuel, Sir. Uh, price at the pump, et cetera, the consumer price index. You got to think of all that, but we don't. Sir. We just, like you said, go to the paper, check it out, and say what's your problem or otherwise, yes, right? So I'm I'd like to invite the audience to come up and ask questions. I'm going to continue asking until I see somebody here. Uh, look at this. <laughs> uh, yes, sir, young Marine. Hey, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Colonel Marty Bedell, Commanding Officer, Marine Corps Station Miramar. Uh, My uh, question is for General Mahoney. Uh, sir, may I have some money? I'm going to save that. Uh, <laughs> he wants money. <laughs> uh, rephrasing the question. Uh, the Commandant talked about the underinvestment in sustainment of infrastructure, which, uh, as a Harrier pilot, is not at uh, face value very exciting to talk about, but uh, now that I am in this billet, I am realizing how critical the facilities are. Hearing SECNAV talk about shipyards, the throughput uh, of, of the ability to do a thing, our facilities are uh, old, and that's, that's, I don't think, the problem. I think the problem is when we build a new facility, we do not treat it the same way we would an aircraft or a ship in terms of the sustainment strategy and uh, resourcing requirement. So with $13 billion of deferred maintenance for the installations community on the facilities that support the warfighting capability, how do we, how do we get after this, this hole that we seem to be in, sir? Yeah, hey, hey thanks, and I'll, I'll, I'll let the URA go to you, that's, that's good. Um, the tenets of, of the modernization of the force are in uh, material solutions programs, talent management, and training and education. Integral to every single one of those is installations and sustainment of those installations. We have been causing our own installation debt for decades to that figure that you just quoted, and I could quote you one that's at least double that uh, as far as getting on the right track. As well, what we are realizing that if we are going to be true to managing talent and quality of life, we cannot continue to invest in inst installation debt or not invest and cause more debt. Okay, all that philosophy aside, what you're going to see is probably a fourth pillar of, of the redesign of the force, and that is installations and sustainment. One of the initial initiatives that we've taken is the resource maximization tool, and I, I know you're probably familiar with that. Does that get you more money? No, it doesn't. But what this does is shows that with the money we have, we are spending it in the best way possible and not, as you, as you pointed out, dumping money into potentially an installation, a building, a part of the physical plant that cannot be rescued. Uh, so how important is it? And what do we think the investment should be so that we can turn around and say, with every dollar you give us, we are investing it uh, to, the, to the highest point of optimization. Then, and it will be in parallel, it won't be, it won't be a serial sort of argument, uh, we need more money. Uh, in kind of prognosticating to 24, you're going to see front and center focus on Installations and sustainment, I, I kind of break those two apart, but they're definitely related. Uh, and we're going to have to take it a bite at the time. That number you rolled out and the number that I have in my head is not digestible in one palm cycle, certainly not digestible 
in a budget year. But the first thing we got to do is realize the debt situation that we're in, realize that installations and sustainment are part and parcel to power projection and talent management. And as you say, don't put it at the back of the train. It needs to be in its proper priority place uh, in the quality of life discussion, in the environment discussion, in once again, the power projection discussion. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir, it does. Thanks. Thank you very much. All right, sir. Hi, John Klein, Johnson Controls, and a retired Navy captain, uh, served in the Navy Civil Engineer Corps, worked in the shore for, for 30 years, and uh, my question is kind of going to follow what Marty said, is we don't have, and, and it, it riffs off of what you said, General Mahoney, get rid of what you don't need. We lack funds to support the shore. We take risk in the shore, which means that our shore can't work like we want it to work, and we can't cyber secure the OT infrastructure to protect the shore, so why not just divest and reduce the shore to what we can afford instead of taking risk there, which that risk produces a vulnerability that our adversaries could, could use against us. And, and follow on that, we, because we lack the investment, we can't manage in the cloud our infrastructure data so that we could model and, and make good risk decisions so we, we, man, we hand jam the, the data. Uh, thank you. So do you, I, I'm not trying to be coy. Is there a question in there? Yeah, you, and, the, and the question is, get rid of what you don't need. Exactly what and, General Mahoney yeah. said is let's, right. let's reduce our infrastructure. And, and so That's your, the question, your question is, is there a process other than a base realignment and closing, which is a law, it's very laborious, process to roll up bases, move in fence lines. Is that your, kind of your exactly. question? Exactly. Just shutter, shutter the bases. Yeah. So let me ask the panel if you're aware of anything like that. Has it been tried, et cetera? It, I'll just I'll, I'll see if I can be a little bit more eloquent about this thing called the resource maximization tool uh, that, that uh, we rolled out last year, and it will, you know, we'll continue to use it and see how it performs. Part of that tool in the linear programming uh, scheme that it is, is demolition. It will, the tool will offer to you data-based analytics that says this part of the physical plant is beyond help. It cannot help you in not only its import or its contribution to power projection, talent management, quality of life, or environment, or other variables that go in to what's a math problem that's well above my competence. But part of it is demo. Well, it doesn't answer the BRAC question, but in this tool that we will use to inform decision making going forward, it will say, look, you got to get rid of these things that are in your portfolio because they're not, they're, they're adding to your debt. Yeah, I think for Coast Guard, we have similar challenges. I think what we've started to do, though, is treat our shore infrastructure in the same way as our other capital assets, right? So enrolling shore infrastructure plants inside the same logistics management systems to understand what the conditions are, what the gaps are. So we can lay that next to our cutters, aircraft, other hard assets, our C5I, enterprise mission platform, and then understand how those investments stack up, rather than always, as General Mahoney talked about, ending up, which we shouldn't do, putting the shore infrastructure at the back end. And so a different approach and process so we understand what those gaps, and this is important at a time where the Coast Guard, as we bring all of these new amazing cutters to the waterfront, um, we, like we have not done in at least 75 years. We're going to need strategic home ports for polar security cutters in places like Seattle, uh, for building out of Charleston, where we are home porting four national security cutters, and with the room for potential for more cutters as well. And we're at the point of launching the first in class of the offshore patrol cutter, which will be the largest fleet acquisition piece in Coast Guard history. Um, and so we need a shore infrastructure plant and strategic approach that will, that will work there. Um, and we're able to balance that investment. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, Admiral. Uh, Paul Rosbolt from Systems Planning and Analysis. Uh, I want to ask about a couple of accounts that seem to have similar uh, challenges, and that's SCN and WPN. And specifically for both of them, uh, it seems like industrial capacity is limiting our ability to build both ships and replenish our weapon stocks quickly enough. And industry uh, 
would invest if they had a stable, increased level of funding. You know, you're going you're gonna to fix the capacity issue over a period of years. They'd invest their own money. Otherwise, Navy may have to, you know, plus up for their own facilities. So, general question there is, how do you deal with that from a budget perspective, specifically in WPN and SCN? Yeah, thank you, sir. I'll take a crack at that one. Um, yeah, it's the, the, the circle of life is Congress, industrial base, and the department, how we budget, right? <clears throat> and uh, so the short answer, of course, is multi-year contracts. And, uh, and so with SEN, it's quite simple. How many can you build a year? Uh, you know, let's get a multi-year contract. This year, SecDef, and I don't want to speak for him or quote him, but he's had industry come see him. There's been, uh, with help with Congress, uh, a lot of effort put into the industrial base with respect to munitions and weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, to the extent that we can uh, put more multi-year contracts together for certain weapon systems, that makes sense. Um, because industry wants that signal, right? Hey, I will invest if you show me this. So I think we need to partner with that and do that as well. Um, and then Congress, you may be aware, put in some money into the appropriation in 23 about supporting the industrial base of weapons. Uh, we've made investments in the submarine industrial base, but they led by putting money for the weapons industrial base. Uh, I intend to uh, take their lead in tw 23 and, and try to uh, put some money in the budget in 24 to get after that element as well from an organic industrial base because we can all see that we need to be prepared here now. How do we get into uh, increased footing for development and, and production of weapons? And so um, I think there's synergies ongoing at this time for that. Over. You good, Chris, or do you want to comment on the weapons? You good? Good. No? No, you, I mean, in order to energize someone to do something, you've got to show commitment You've got to show stability, and uh, everything that Admiral Gumbleton said, you know, is is pointing in that direction with the the, the plus ups in 23, and the authorities to put them in a block type of uh, acquisition scheme. Your question been answered? Yeah, thank you. All right, yes, sir. Sir, uh, my name is Mike. I'm a med planner. Uh, Admiral Gumbleton, I was your med planner at ESG3. It's uh, General Mahoney, I want to thank you for bringing up the uh, aviation and history context when you were talking earlier. The question I have, I'm going to frame through a capability of amphibious aircraft, but um, that's just a starting point. Uh, I look at uh, towards distributed maritime operations, of course, looking at you know enablers to do sustainment, CASVAC, multitude of options. I know that there's research and experimentation on adaptive kits for the C-130. I know we're talking DARPA grants. I know our partners, the Japanese, operate the US-2. The Australians are starting to build amphibious aircraft. The applications would cut across the naval service for sustainment, you know, tech reps at sea or CASVAC from our ships. It would support EAB for delivery of Marines. We know it would support search and rescue because the Japanese are using it all the time. And when I look across the partner nations, I want it. I want that because it would make our lives a lot easier. My question to you is, what advice would you give a JO who doesn't have the influence, who doesn't have the rank? How would I make the case to my boss to support this, to try to influence this lofty process of getting resources through FMB or influencing industry? Because I don't see any capabilities that have amphibious aircraft at all. I see about 50 ship models around here. So what can I do as my part to bring that to you? And you know, in, in a general sense, keep doing what you're doing. Keep studying, writing, and talking. Get traction with an audience and, and make your case. Now, in, in the case of expeditionary logistics or logistics in a contested environment, you've got fertile ground right there, my friend. Uh, for our organic movement, maneuver, and sustainment, MV-22, CH-53K, C, uh, the KC-130J, the light, uh, the LSM and traditional amphibious warships round out our capability to maneuver, maneuver, and sustain in a contested environment. If, if once again, there is a hole in that capability set, uh, indicate it, prove it out, and keep, 
keep singing your song. Does that, does that kind of get at it? Yes, I know sir. it's not probably not satisfactory. To, you know, I'll say, hey, here's $4 billion. Come back when you, when you have a KC-130 that can fly in ground effect for 1,000 miles. Sure. Are you good? Thank you. Yes, good, sir. All right, thanks. Yes, sir. Hi, Alberg. My question is about priorities, since dollars will always be limited. If we get a dollar or a billion from Congress, we can buy new platforms with it. We can buy new munitions so that our existing platforms can keep shooting. Or we can invest in, in improving our industrial base so that, if needed, we can ramp up production or we can quickly repair a dozen ships if they need to go in the dock and be put back into the fight. Now, we should be doing all of these things, and I'm sure we are, but where do you see in today's situation where the highest priority is? Let me see if I got that right. Uh, so what is the, if I had an extra dollar or a billion dollars, what would I spend it on I today? Mean, over the next years, I mean, is the highest priority to increase our munition stocks. We've seen in Ukraine that u using munitions goes much faster than many people expected before the latest conflict, or increasing the number of platforms, or increasing the industrial capacity for the future. So in five years, we can quickly ramp up production in a crisis or in, in the case of imminent conflict. Yeah, I think um, you know, when we build a program, uh, it's, it's always about, our, uh, at the end of the day, it's always about what is the highest leverage and what is the risk you're willing to accept. And so you can, whether that happens to be, uh, if we're talking about people, operations, or investments, or in our current strategy is Columbia readiness, capabilities, capacity, right? And so if I have, for example, let's say uh, the industrial base is tapped out and I can't put another dollar into SCN because I can't deliver more Virginias or more destroyers, okay? Let's move to, uh, that was the, let's move to capabilities. What is mature? What is ready to invest in? And back to the previous question, are they solving a key operational problem? Whether that happens to be uh, contested logistics or bringing uh, wounded folks back in a contested area. If that capability is mature, then we could put the dollar against that. And then there's always the number one in the list, of course, is readiness. And so when we build a program, do we get the, do we get the flying hours right? Do we get the steaming days right? Do we get the tank training miles right? Do we get all those things right at the right level of risk? And if I had another dollar, then we kind of weigh out the three. And so that's how it's done. Long answer to a year short question. Sir, if I could maybe add, answer that from the Coast Guard perspective, um, and we do have to have investment across, you know, sustainment and modernization, as we've talked about already. But I think the the most important for the commandant, based on our strategy, is going to be our human work, our human capital, the workforce, transforming our total workforce. I mean, if you look to your left, you're going to see over there at a static display, a 33-foot special purpose craft law enforcement boat, amazing platform. A lot of investment in that acquisition and the sustainment tail, we, that's a whole program we understand. But if you go over there and talk to our maritime security response team West teammates over there, our tactical operators, and you talk to them about their training and why they serve and what they do, you will be reminded as you would for any of the tri-service teams that it's all about the human capital and the talent. Our strategic advantage in the competition described in the NSS is our people, is the joint force. I mean, the weapon systems, the platforms, the shore infrastructure, all that's critical. We need that. Um, but, if, but our game-changing advantage is our people, of course. That's not a surprise. Uh, and so that's where, where the Coast Guard would certainly invest next. And faced with the personnel, the, the recruiting challenges that we are now, the imperative to do that investment is, is even more, more important. Thanks. Yes, sir. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for your time, for coming to this panel. Sir, could you get, get closer uh, to the microphone so we can hear you clearer, more clearly? Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm Mike Babalo. I'm... <laughs> <laughs> These guys telling you what you need to hear? All right, Good. now we can ask some decent questions around here. Get some just, damn answers. I just want to make sure the good admiral here is keeping it straight, you know? Right. I'm agreeing at your change. So, you know, after I became secretary, I uh, was invited by the CNO to talk to all the retired four-star admirals in the Navy. Quite intimidating, you know, for a retired commander to go in there, and you know, we had about an hour and a half, and and uh, and I said, okay, folks, be, before you all start bombarding me with questions, 
I want to ask each and every, I want to ask all of you, who's responsible for the problems I'm putting up with today? And I'll tell you, a few of them looked down at their feet. Not Admiral Greenert, though. I raised my hand. <laughs> Hey, who's supposed to be watching our back here? There was, there was like no update there. Huh? Thanks for the heads up there. So anyway, come yes. on into that mic and let her roll. So I'm the comptroller for Marine Corps Air Station Miramar. I work for Colonel Bedell. Uh, I have three parts. Of course, only one question. The first part is just a quick summary of the environment we find ourselves in financially. Taxpayer confidence, a mosaic of new and legacy systems, copious amounts of data, the continuing resolution that is a continual annual uh, constraint, the post-COVID labor market. The answer to my question, I'm going to give that up front to make things uh, focused, is how are we dealing with the clean audit? And the, the clean audit is the way to get taxpayer confidence. The question I have is, what are your insights on the strategy of the C-Services as well as the broader DOD team to achieve the confidence of the taxpayer and Congress to achieve future increases and in budgets, budgets that are passed on time? What? I'm going to steal the thunder, but I will say the Coast Guard is very proud to be the key part of the Department of Homeland Security passing again uh, the clean audit this past year, despite all those challenges. Um, and that's an important part of our ability to maintain confidence of the American taxpayer. Uh, let me, uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the services have not uh, gained a clean opinion, none of them. Uh, in the Marine Corps case, We've done a few things. Uh, the first is we have migrated, again, to get at taxpayer trust, to get to the point where we can look at the appropriators or look at the members and say, if you give us a dollar or this level of resourcing, we can trace that dollar from the appropriation to its liquidation, tell you what you bought, tell you the modifications that it underwent, and we got rid of it at this point, and here's where we're going to move it uh, on our asset sheet. So two, two things that I just talked about. First is migrating our general ledger to uh, an ERP, to an enterprise resource program, uh, the four-letter word called DAI. Uh, tough transition, you know, the promise of technology. All it is is moving digits from one place to another, not quite. But what it does for us is it puts us in a system that is auditable. The old accounting system was never going to be auditable, not without a huge amount of mandrolics. So we have taken the general ledger and migrated it toward a digital solution that is audible, a SOC 1 uh, opinion, if people are familiar with that. We are still in the midst of doing that to a standard that will get us toward an audit. The second thing that we have done is asked and received with the support of the department uh, a, what we call a continuous audit. The audit timeline now is, is uh, year over year. And at least three months of the back end are out briefing what you did, and three months of the front end are planning what you're going to do. So what we asked for was, can we have a two-year continuous audit where the first year is not going after an opinion? We buy back that time. We do remediation and test. We get after the material weaknesses and the, and the um, corrective action plans. And then in the second year, we go more towards uh, sampling and reaching standards um, per uh, the independent auditor. We have made, and this is not cheerleading, we, it's as basic as it sounds, we have made big strides on the material side. What do you own? Where is it? Who, who counted it? And what's it worth? I mean, up until very recently, I could not look the commandant in the eye and tell him that. Uh, we're getting to that point. Now we have to put a value on that, and we have to go forward and continue to value it correctly so that we can put it on the books in an accurate way. We have to get our financial tr transactions, the universe of transactions that go on up there, to a reasonable point of auditability so that our funds balance with Treasury, our checkbook, what we say we have and what the Treasury says we have is balanced per transaction. So long story boring, migrate to an auditable system, and then we've gotten a two-year stretch to get toward an opinion. Does that answer your question, Bill, at least part of it? I mean, imagine the power of being able to stand up in front of, pick your audience, and once again say, this is traceable to an audit standard, this dollar to disposal, to liquidation. Uh, we can't do that yet. 
Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, good morning. Jim Collins, Navy captain, retired, currently work at WD up in Point Magoo. Uh, I almost sat down because there's been two infrastructure questions already, but I had a caveat to it. Uh, specifically, Navy Pier Space. Uh, about five years ago, I remember Vice Admiral Brown, Third Fleet at the time, uh, talking often and loudly about how he was going to run out of pier space in 26 based on the ship production and home porting plans. Uh, the infrastructure for the piers at Navy Base San Diego and up in Port Warnemi are pretty poor. Electrical is uh, falling apart and the piers are not being able to support uh, heavy lifts in a lot of places. So currently, what's the plan for fixing pier space? And secondly, I heard the SECNAV this morning talk about staffing a new infrastructure plan. So uh, what would you recommend we put in there? That's all I had. Thanks. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll take a crack at that. So I heard a couple of things. I heard uh, limited peer space needs more work. And then you also mentioned uh, infrastructure. I think you're referring to the shipyard infrastructure optimization plan. No, I'm not talking about shipyards. Okay. I'm talking about uh, active ship pier space. Uh, okay. We have we have a we have an issue there with, with uh, quality of some piers, so we can't put some ships in some slots, and uh, can't do some operations at some piers because of uh, structural problems. Yeah, indeed, thank you for that question. Um, to to yes or to speak to that question is. Uh, so we obviously need some investment in our peers, but it's even more uh, challenging than that is we bring on our new class ships that have a different electrical buses and electrical distributions. So we find ourselves uh, having to do shipyard maintenance as because it, all ship maintenance isn't done with our industrial partners. Often it's done on our own peers. And so now we have uh, certain peers that we can do maintenance on. We have certain peers that have only electrical loads that can uh, handle certain class ships. And that, of course, is all uh, part of the challenge that we have to get after. It's been said already about uh, where does one take risk in your budget? <clears throat> and so I think as we're coming uh, through this journey, and I would go back, uh, I think taking risk in the shore side has been as, as old as time itself. But it was exacerbated as we uh, came through the, uh, the last 20 years in the desert, and then also sequestration is where we didn't have a strategy of Columbia readiness, capabilities, and capacity. We actually took a lot of risk in our ships, production. We took a lot of risk in readiness, and we continue to take risk in our shore. As we approach 23 and 24, getting ready to the fight and understanding that runways, piers, everything is, is merely a platform from which to deploy lethal means, and we have to take care of them. The Navy is now considering where can we no longer accept reputational risk? We can't have a pier that's going to fall down or a building that ha does not have hot water for sailors or Marines in it. And so we're seeing where, uh, although the metric in Congress was we would submit a budget with our sustainment funding at 85%, let's say, and the restoration maintenance accounts, we're adding much more money to that. Congress is adding money to that with a clear-eyed view that uh, the problem for which you s stated is real and we have to get after that. So my answer is we are addressing that, not to the extent that we would like, because it's always about a balance, but we're getting after that. Yes, ma'am. Last one. All right. Hi, Mallory Shelbourne with US 9 News. My question is for Admiral Gumbleton. Um, will the cost for the next generation air dominance program, the R&D cost, be classified in the next budget? I remember your question from last budget rollout asking me the same question. So I guess you're going to ask me again, huh? Yes. <laughs> um, believe it or not, we're looking at that. I don't know if it'll, uh, what the classification will be on March 9th when we roll out the budget, um, but with serious thought as to declassifying that. Uh, so the intent is there. 
there's a, a cottage industry on declassifying things and how long that takes, but there is intent to do so. So you can ask me an artful question on March 9th. Thank you. Okay, so before, uh, that's the last question, but uh, you're all gonna get a book, but Mrs. Greenert and I would like you to have something to have, it's got a lot of caffeine in it. All right. So that when you read your books, because you're busy people, there's some chocolate and toffee for each of you. Thank you for being good panelists. And uh, now I'll turn it over to Bill. Before I thank the panel, I, I did want to ask if the J.O. who asked the question to uh, the general is still in the audience, I want to say that uh, I can help you find your audience. As the editor-in-chief of Proceedings, I would love to have you write for us, and I would love to help amplify the message and the question that you had, so please uh, come see me afterwards. Uh, for our panel and for Admiral Greener, thank you so much for your insights today. Uh, for the audience, for the questions that you ask, because the give and take is always the real power of coming to West. Uh, we have, uh, on behalf of AFSIA International and the Naval Institute, we have a book, uh, Fighting the Fleet, by Jeff Cares and Anthony Cowden. And uh, please join me in a round of applause for our panel. <laughs>